Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Frank Caprio. I'm from Hosemaster in Cleveland, Ohio. Glad to be spending time with you today, Air Hydro Power and other, and other guests as well this morning. I'm here with Paul Long, our regional sales manager, and I am broadcasting remotely from my home in beautiful Northwest Akron, Ohio, where the high temperature is going to hit a record 94 degrees today. So uh, in the house, got the windows closed and the air conditioning on. Uh, so nobody will bother me other than maybe the house cat intruding in my, my office here this morning. So welcome, everyone. Uh, today we're going to spend uh, about 45 minutes or so this morning and allow time for questions at the end, uh, talking about metal hose expansion joints, design, installation, handling. Uh, it's a very abbreviated course this morning given the time allotment that we have, but we'll certainly pack as much good information in here as we can. Um, I'm told by Tom that we're, we're cleared for takeoff. I'm going to, at this point, hand it over to uh, Paul Long just to uh, add anything he can, can add in at the beginning of our, our training session today. So, Paul, if you're, you're on the line, go ahead and, uh, and, and take over. I will. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, can, I, can you hear me first? Sure can. Awesome. Um, we are very grateful. Uh, for the opportunity uh, on behalf of Air Hydro and their customers to present this webinar to you. A um, little funny thing is that with Metal Hose, we can design at Hosemaster the best product, the most rigorous product for an application. However, if we don't get the data up front to design that hose properly, we could design the most the greatest hose in the history of metal hose, which we do already. Um, but if we don't get the data correctly up front, that hose assembly still may fail prematurely out in the field. And that's what we want to prevent at all costs. We want to uh, look at the longevity of the product, do the best we can on the upfront design um, and accessories and the mentioning of that assembly up front so it can last as long as humanly possible in its application. So once again, thank you for the time. Uh, for some, this may be a little bit rudimentary. However, it's as important as any component when we go into um, uh, designing and offering our products to our distributors and our customers. So thank you very much. And with that, Frank, you're on. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. All right, so um, we're going to dig right in this morning. I will stop occasionally to see if there's any questions, and we will have a, a question and answer session uh, at the end of our presentation this morning. So we'll have opportunities for everybody to pitch in. Uh, the chat function, I believe, is working. So if anybody has a, a question, they can throw it up on the chat board as well, and we'll be happy to, to answer them as they come. So today we're going to talk about this corrugated metal hose, assembly design, installation, and handling. A little bit about Hosemaster. Uh, we are the largest U.S. industrial manufacturer of corrugated metal hose. We also provide expansion joints for those applications. So we produce both the metal flexible corrugated hose, metal strip wound hose, and metal expansion joints for these various industrial applications. Um, our forming technologies are the best in the industry, resulting in a superior corrugated hose. It's all about reducing the stress to that metal when you're forming those corrugations so that metal has more stress to give once it is put in service at the customer. We also back that up with engineering, manufacturing excellence. 10% of our workforce is dedicated to research, engineering, technical services to make sure, as Paul stated, that we're always designing the absolute best assembly for that application and also continuously work to improve our product offering so that your customers, the end users of these products, get the best value out of these products. I know it sounds like a commercial, but it's absolutely true. Our constant goal is to support our industrial distributors with the best products, the best technical support, so that our products work and give the true best value that our customers can get. 
get my slides going in the right direction here. To that end, our, I work out of our headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio. Paul and I work out of that Cleveland facility, and that's the picture in the top. You can kind of see there's different colors of that building, and that's because Hosemaster has expanded over the years. Uh, back when I started, I've been with Hosemaster uh, 28, almost 28 years now. Um, and when I started, we were just that kind of medium gray blue uh, section in the center. And since then, we've expanded out in both directions on that Cleveland, Ohio facility. When I started, we had 55 employees. Now we're around 400 employees. We have remote locations in Houston, Texas, where we just expanded our capabilities down there, moved into a, a new facility about a, a little over a year ago. Uh, then our second uh, fabricating facility was opened up in Atlanta, Georgia. The Houston, Texas opened up, gosh, I'm going to guess over 20 years ago. Atlanta's been 17 or so years ago. And then Reno, Nevada opened up in 2015 to help support our distributors and be able to get them product when they need it. We make three things at Hosemaster. The first one, and the one we'll spend most of our time on today, is the corrugated metal hose. So you take a tube, a thin wall tube of material, enter corrugations into it to give it the ability to flex, and then cover that corrugated tube with braid to give it the ability to withstand high pressures. Excellent for gas, liquid transfers, very heat resistant, radiation resistant. We'll talk about all the reasons why you use a metal hose. The second product we make is a strip wound metal hose, and it's used for transfer of bulk materials, high temperature ducting, et cetera. And then we make metal expansion joints to handle axial and lateral movements in a pipeline system. There are many certifications that are required for our products depending on where it's going to be installed. And Hosemaster has achieved various industry certifications and approvals by various industries for our products. Some of these approvals can be very cumbersome to achieve at the distributor level. So by us going after and, and obtaining these approvals, we uh, enable our products to be sold by our distributors that also conform to these application requirements to these specific certifications, specifications, et cetera. Uh, we, all of our welders are required to uh, achieve certification to section nine of ASME's boiler pressure vessel code. We also have components, piping components that can be used on uh, fired uh, boiler systems that are applicable and, and have the ASME U designator, as well as repairs and pressure piping, uh, various marine certifications, Canadian certifications if anything's being sold um, north of the border and the pressure equipment directive for any products that are being sold worldwide. Uh, PED is similar to, to the ASME boiler and pressure vessel code. So just let us know if you need us to conform to any of those certifications. The next slide is very important, and that's when to use our product. And the answer is when nothing else will work, right? If a rubber hose will do the job, if a plastic hose will do the job, if a composite hose will do the job, then use those products. If they're suitable for the intended application, there's no reason why we should try and talk you out of using those. However, here are the reasons that people would look towards using a metal hose in the applications. And the first and foremost reason would be those temperature extremes. If either the media or the surrounding environment around the hose is extremely hot or extremely cold, metal hose is gonna be the only thing that can handle those temperature extremes. Remember, if a hose is being used at elevated temperatures, metals get softer as the temperatures increase, and we must apply temperature derating factors to our products in order to obtain the derated working pressure if it's being used in a very high temperature application. And again, our people can assist you with that. The second reason to use a metal hose, and it's just as important as the first one, so I have two number ones on this slide, <laughs> is chemical compatibility. If the hose is going to be exposed to aggressive chemicals, again, either internally or externally, metal hose is a great choice there. We can select components of construction and select alloys for that metal hose and the fittings that can be resistant to the corrosive aspects of the application, the corrosive media or a corrosive environment. And we see a lot of that on the, the coastal areas where hoses are being used in saltwater environments, those chlorides in the, 
in the salt air can attack your 300 series stainless steels. The application may require the use of a high nickel alloy. Permeation concerns is another reason why metal hoses are used, even if the application requirements really aren't severe, otherwise that would require the use of a metal hose. So if permeation is a concern, meaning you don't want any of that media to permeate through the wall of the hose, which can happen with rubber hoses, Teflon hoses, and composite hoses. Metal hose, but for all practical purposes, does not allow that permeation to occur. And if keeping that media inside the hose is important, a metal hose may be required. Another thing is the potential for catastrophic failure. Even if a metal corrugated hose is grossly overpressurized, way above its working pressure, and beyond its rated burst pressure, it generally doesn't suffer a catastrophic failure. With metal hoses, what happens if it's overpressurized, the corrugations start to inflate, and eventually the metal fatigues and a small crack uh, forms allowing the product to leak at a slower rate. Metal hoses don't explode like hand grenades and send shrapnel flying around. If there are concerns about that, we can install a strip-wound metal guard over the outside of that corrugated hose assembly as an additional safety component to add safety to that hose assembly if there is the uh, prospect of a gross overpressurization of the assembly. Fitting retention is not an issue with metal hoses because the fittings are welded onto the ends. They're in here, you know, incorporated into that metal hose. So we don't see fitting blow-offs like is possible with non-metallic hoses that have barbed or crimped fittings. Also, metal hoses can be used where abrasion or overbending are concerns by adding that strip wound either internally inside the hose as a liner to protect those corrugations from abrasive media. Also, that strip wound interlocking hose can be installed on the outside of that assembly to protect the hose from external abrasion or to protect it from being overbent. Because metal hose is made out of all metal, metal hose, metal fittings, metal braid, welded together with metal filler rod, they're excellent in applications where fire safety is required. Obviously, non-metallic hoses have temperature limits and they are vulnerable to melting or deteriorating under a direct flame, whereas metal hose maintains its integrity in those applications. Also, metal hose is able to achieve and maintain a full vacuum because of that permeation factor and uh, the lack of permeation. So it's able to hold and maintain that vacuum without vacuum decay. Also, the corrugations in that tube give it excellent hoop strength so that those that hose will not collapse under a full vacuum. So sometimes there are applications where a metal hose might be used instead of a rubber hose in a vacuum application where there's a potential that a non-metal hose could collapse. Also, metal hoses are very versatile and they allow for a great flexibility in fitting configurations. Pretty much any fitting that is made of a weldable material can be incorporated into a corrugated metal hose assembly and in any order. We routinely uh, fabricate assemblies that uh, might be what we refer to as a dog leg, where you have two separate hoses that are joined using a common pipe elbow between them. And those provide certain application benefits uh, as opposed to a single hose that has to be installed in that 90 degree bend. By using that elbow fitting to perform that bend, it frees up additional corrugations in the length of that assembly to accommodate the movements and vibration of the application. So we, we've made hose assemblies that look like goal posts where there's five hose assemblies attached with various piping fittings and, and different fittings. So there's a lot of flexibility in that fitting configuration with metal hose assemblies. When specifying a metal hose assembly, there are, most applications require a standard braided metal hose assembly as pictured on this slide. And there's four basic components of that metal hose assembly. There's the inner corrugated stainless steel hose itself, referred to as the tube in this diagram, covered by a layer of metallic braid, typically stainless steel, but we can use high nickel alloys there as well, in addition to high nickel alloys for the corrugated hose itself. <clears throat> the third component is that stainless steel braid collar on each end of the assembly, which assists in fabrication of this assembly and also uh, prohibits some certain movements in that heat affected zone where the fittings are welded to the ends of the hose. And then there's the fittings themselves. 
So those are the four basic components of that metal hose assembly. There's many different fitting options, as we just mentioned, and we spend a lot of time in Hosemaster University discussing the different fitting options. We have to make sure that we get all the correct information from our customers. If it's a pipe fitting, we need to know the schedule and the alloy of that pipe. If it's a flange connection, we need to know the alloy, the size, the pressure class, the, the face configuration of that flange. Is it a raised face or a flat face, et cetera? So we need to make sure to get all that fitting information so that we build that assembly correctly. The next component is that stainless steel braid. And quite frankly, this is where some of our competitors take some shortcuts when manufacturing their products, and they use a sparser braid coverage than we do, allowing for gaps in between each of those strands of braid. So this braid is very important because it gives that corrugated hose the ability to withstand pressure, but also depending on that braid design, it can um, help prevent the braid from wearing into the hose as that hose is cycled in service. So our braid packages are designed to give the proper balance between braid strength and hose flexibility. It also, we use a very high percentage braid coverage. And the reason that's important is by using more wires of a smaller diameter in each one of those strands of braid on that braid on the hose, it helps to uh, protect against damage to the hose and very importantly, it improves cycle life. Those sparser braid coverages that you might see where you can actually see corrugations peeking through gaps in the braid by competing products is a signal to you that that hose and that braid was designed to save money, not to enhance cycle life. Because with those sparser braid coverage, the tendency as the hose is cycled is for those wires to start digging into the outside of those corrugations. By using our high percentage braid coverage, we help to minimize that effect. Also, it's very important to keep the braid tight against the hose at all times. And that's why we machine apply the braid directly to our hose to make sure that braid is snug, tight against the hose to provide additional protection against hose deformation, which can occur if that braid is allowed to slack away from that hose and can result in squirming of that hose where metal fatigue sets in very quickly and you lose the value of that hose assembly. We can also apply multiple layers of braid to increase the maximum working pressure of that hose. Let's see here. Go with me a second. Next are the braid collars. And these provide protection to that hose assembly. The brake collars are installed at each end of the cut section of that hose, and they help to keep the hose and the braid uh, packed together to facilitate welding. The first weld is performed, which, which joins the hose, the braid, and the end of those brake collars together to form something we call the cap weld. That cap weld is the pressure bearing weld of that assembly. It prevents that hose from just elongating back into a tube when it's pressurized. The braid sort of acts like the Chinese finger trap toy that we all played with as youngsters. Once that cap weld is performed, then we add fittings onto the end of that with a fitting attachment weld, and that assembly is ready to go into service. All that welding creates a heat affected zone at the ends of the hose, and it anneals that metal and reduces its cycle life. And that's why those last few corrugations must be isolated from any movement, and that's the function that the braid collar performs. So it's a very important component of this hose assembly, and it's important that you minimize that heat affected zone and keep it within this, the length of those braid collars during fabrication. And Hosemaster and Air Hydro Power are all have welding hose specialists to make sure that that hose is welded with a maximum of fusion, making sure everything's joined together property, properly, but a minimum of a heat affected zone. Next, we move to the hose itself, and the forming process that is used is very important as to the end cycle life of that hose. Our hose products mostly are annular profiles where each corrugation is a separate ring that's straight and parallel to each other. We use various proprietary forming processes to form that tube. We start off with a very high quality steel strip. The smoother that surface finish that we use on that steel, the less imperfections in the surface of that steel exist to where a corrosion cell can set up and initiate. We then take that strip of steel and form it into an airtight tube by doing a weld that is purged 
inside and out. That purging displaces the oxygen away from that metal during welding to minimize any oxidation of that seam weld. So it's very important that the seam weld, as well as all those fabrication, the fitting attachment welds are all performed with fully purged welds in order to minimize oxidation, which makes that metal more vulnerable to fatigue and corrosion on set. So purging is a very vital uh, part of metal host fabrication, both in manufacturing of the host and fabricating the assemblies. So we form those corrugations into the hose using our various forming processes. Our claim to fame is our hydroforming process, which uses water to form those corrugations. It's a very gentle process. It minimizes wall thinning. We could spend you know, lots of time this morning just talking about the benefits of our forming processes and how it imparts minimal residual stress into those corrugations, which means it's going to last longer in service. This is our range of corrugated metal hose products. Our standard product is our Annuflex. It is our benchmark of our, our annular hose products. It has good working pressure rating, good flexibility. It's a very pliable product in that it's easy to bend and to put in the application. And for most industrial applications, it's the go-to product, the first one that, that should be looked at for most applications. It's available in different alloys. Uh, Different layers of brake can be added to it to enhance its pressure ratings. And it has uh, some performance data that we'll look at in just a second. If you need a more flexible hose, either because the hose is going to be bent more tightly or because it's going to be cycling more frequently, then we take that Anuflex and basically compress it using a special operation to form our master flex. And by increasing the number of corrugations per foot of hose, that master flex is able to be bent more tightly or undergo a higher cycle life because you have more corrugations per foot to help enhance that flexibility and cycle life of that hose. If you need a hose that's in a static application, we make a special product called Formaflex. It is basically a piece of Anuflex that's been heat treated to anneal the product, which makes it like a paperclip. You can bend it and it'll stay in place just like that paperclip. However, like that paper clip, it cannot be used in a bending or cycling application because when you bend that paper clip back and forth a few times, it will snap. And the same with Formaflex. So it can only be used in a static application where no dynamics, no movements occur. For higher pressures, we can make our products out of heavier wall thicknesses. And that's our pressure flex for high pressures or pressure max HP. That pressure max HP is a great product there's just nothing in the industry that can handle the combination of high pressures and maintain flexibility in terms of a nice tight bend radius. There are hoses out there that may have higher pressure ratings, but they become very, very stiff. They're hard to bend, they have low cycle life, and Pressure Max HP is just the best combination of flexibility as well as high pressure rating. If you have corrosive applications, we can make our Anuflex hose out of a special alloy that's a member of the Hasseloy family. It's a 276 alloy, and that's what we call our ChemKing hose for general chemical transfer applications. Sour gas, sour crude, um, aggressive chemical applications, um, uh, chlorine-containing chemicals, sulfur-containing chemicals would be applications where that ChemKing can be used. We sell ChemKing to an oil refinery that was optimized to handle sour crude in its refining operations. And they were having corrosion problems with 300 series stainless steel hoses until they switched over to our ChemKing product. If the application is chlorine loading and unloading, then we take that ChemKing hose and make it into an assembly that we call Chlorsafe. Specially fabricated out of that ChemKing, but it's fabricated into that assembly with special safety fe features, external armor guard, special smooth transition welds to enhance the performance of that hose. It's specifically designed for those chlorine loading and unloading applications. Customers want to use a metal hose for that application because metal hose offers fire safety, that low permeation rate that we spoke of, positive fitting retention. But the other metal hoses that are out in the industry, most of them are made out of Monel, which is not resistant to chlorine when water is present, or what they refer to as wet chlorine. Because of that, most customers have switched over to Teflon hoses for that application, PTFE, which 
has problems with permeation, fitting retention. It's not fire safe. So chlorosafe is the best of both worlds. It offers the fire safety and no permeation like a metal hose does, but also offers resistant to wet chlorine like PPFE product does. If you ever need to make a presentation on the chlorosafe assemblies, Paul Long will be happy to make a joint call with you and go over all those features and benefits in, in great detail. We do offer bronze hose and braid if the application requires it. And we have a couple of products that are a helically, uh, helical corrugated hose, but they're not made in the traditional helical sense where a tube is sent through something similar to a screw machine. We have special spirally welded products called ExtraFlex and HydroFlex um, that can be used in certain applications, but they are, um, do have some drawbacks because of the helical design. So we want to make sure that they would not be misapplied in those applications. And again, we can work with you on that. I know that this is impossibly small print to read, and this is a cut sheet of our Anuflex product. Basically, it's available in sizes from quarter inch diameter up to 12 inch diameter. If you need a hose larger than 12 inch diameter, we have that available as well. We can offer a series of bellows, expansion joint bellows that are spliced together and covered with braid to be able to offer hoses in sizes up through 24 inch diameter. So we can offer larger sizes as well. All these columns, the, the first column is the size, the second column shows the number of braids, the third column shows the OD of the hose. And then there's two columns in the middle, one's labeled static minimum bend radius and dynamic minimum bend radius. I'm pointing that out today because it's very important to understand the difference between the two. In most hose applications, you want to make sure to honor the dynamic minimum bend radius of the hose. That number allows the hose to be bent and cycled and to resist vibration without deforming the corrugations in the process. And that dynamic uh, bend radius is applicable to most metal hose applications because in most hose applications, there's some sort of movements or dynamics required, whether it's cycling, vibration, or even large pressure fluctuations. All those can cause those corrugations in that hose to change their profile, and those are all therefore considered dynamics, and that dynamic minimum bend radius should therefore be used. The only time the static minimum bend radius should be used is if the, the hose is installed in a very, very tight bend, and it doesn't see any dynamics from there, that point on. You're basically deforming those corrugations to achieve that static minimum bend radius, and they cannot react to any further dynamics once that happens. And there's very few hose applications where no dynamics are present. So the rule of thumb is to always use that minimum dynamic bend radius and never go below that number when the hose is installed in cycling. The next uh, column is the maximum allowable working pressure of the hose, which increases by adding additional layers of braid. We list the burst pressure of our products and the weight per foot for all of our hose products. There's next is when specifying a corrugated metal hose assembly, these are all the things that we need to know in order to formulate a, a quotation for that metal hose product. Uh, we need to know the hose, the type of the ones we just looked at, Anuflex, Masterflex, et cetera, available in different alloys, different sizes. Need to know the end fitting configurations for each end of the assembly, as well as the length of the assembly, and any special fabrication options and accessories that we'll look at in a moment. Here's a picture of one of those dog leg assemblies on the upper left-hand photo there, and a picture of a special assembly called a jacketed hose on the right-hand side. We'll talk about that in more detail in a second. If you don't have all these answers to the, all of these questions, let us help you figure out the answer to those questions. We also have various testing options available. The first one is our standard leak testing. 100% of our assemblies that we ship out and that Air Hydro makes and, and sends out are somehow leak tested to make sure the hose is leak free before shipment. It usually consists of pressurizing the hose with air and submerging the assembly underwater to check for any signs of leaks. But sometimes additional testing may be recommended or requested by the customer. Those include hydrostatic or high pressure gas testing, either using water or a compressed gas, compressed air, compressed nitrogen, whatever it may be in order to test the pressure strength of that assembly. Hydrostatic testing you guys perform routinely at your location on all hose types, metal, rubber, et cetera, and we can perform that on metal hoses as well. 
sometimes water isn't desirable as the testing media, so that's where we would use the high pressure gas instead. Dye penetrant testing is a, uh, just that. It's using a dye to detect any microscopic cracks or porosities in a weld. Um, and it's usually required as part of conformance to one of those industry specifications we looked at earlier, and we are able to perform that. Helium mass spectrometer testing is a very um, sensitive leak detection test, typically used for critical service applications. Uh, and there is a, a rating you know, uh, attached to that as to how specific the test must be. So we can work with you on that if that's required as well. And there are other tests available. PMI stands for positive material identification. Again, usually specified by the customer in critical service applications to verify that all metal components of that hose assembly were made out of the specified alloy. X-ray testing, also referred to as radiographic inspection, electrical continuity, et cetera. We also have specialized cleaning available for specific applications. Remember, any hoses being used for oxygen service must be cleaned and degreased. We clean the CGAG 4.1 unless uh, some other uh, cleaning standard is specified. These are some of the accessories that we can add on to those corrugated metal hoses. Spring guards to protect the outside of the assembly from damage. It could either be a metal spring guard or the pig's pigtail wrap. Other protective covers, PVC blue lay flat water discharge hose is often used as an expensive protective cover or that yellow PVC sleeping pictured. We can apply fire jacket and other insulating jackets to the outside of the hose as pictured in the bottom right hand photo, not only to protect the media inside the hose from external heat but also to protect workers from coming into contact with a hose assembly that's conveying hot media, steam, hot oil, et cetera. And we have various tagging and certification available upon request. As mentioned, here's a picture of a lined assembly where we insert a strip wound hose liner into the interior of a corrugated metal hose. That's used for one of two purposes, either to protect the corrugations from abrasive media that liner provides a very rugged and abrasion resistant uh, protection to those corrugations. The other reason that liner might be used is in very high velocity applications to protect that high velocity media from crashing into those corrugations, which can set up a resonant vibration and cause those corrugations to use up all their useful fatigue life very quickly. Or we can put that armor guard on the outside of the assembly to help protect it from external abrasion or from, to protect the hose from being overbent, especially in applications where it's being manually handled by the customer. We also offer jacketed assemblies, just like a jacketed pipe. The inner hose is the main transfer hose encased by an outer hose through which is circulated in media to keep that inner hose precisely heated or cooled. These are very often used in uh, for the transfer of molten sulfur in desulfurization units in oil and gas plants and oil refineries. Uh, it can be used to uh, precisely heat uh, some food products prior to pasteurization or purification. Uh, so a lot of application. Also, we can draw a vacuum in that outer hose and use it to insulate the inner hose for cryogenic liquid transfer at very low temperatures. We also have a traced assembly that has tracer hoses running through the interior of a hose to help keep that hose, uh, the, uh, any products from getting um, hardening up and, and impacting inside the corrugations. It's very important moving on to talking about the design of that assembly that all the components selected are able to meet the requirements of the intended application. Not only are the components required to meet the requirements, but also the fabrication becomes very important once those components have been selected. So the procedures and care used when fabricating that assembly has a dramatic effect on that assembly's performance. And that's why it's very important that hoses are fabricated by someone like AHP or Hosemaster that has welders specially trained uh, to weld those assemblies together. So we can, we've invested a considerable amount of resources developing a state-of-the-art fabrication and welder training center, and we share that technology with AHP. There's our, the famous stamped acronym that is used in our hose industry to get all the application requirements uh, to make sure we design and select the best hose assembly for that application. 
The stamped acronym is pretty self-explanatory, the size, the temperature, both internal and external, the application, how is it being used, the media that will be run through the assembly, and also what's the environment in which the hose will be installed, is there any external corrosion factors, what's the pressure, what are the end fittings, and for metal hose, we call the D dynamics. And basically what we're looking at there, is there any vibration? Is there high velocity media running through the assembly that might require the use of the liner, um, et cetera? So um, that's what we look for for the D is to determine if a liner is required. Once we get that information, then we have to select the hose for that assembly. And the three main reason, uh, products or aspects we would look at when selecting a hose are its ability to handle the pressure, how flexible does it have to be, and what does it need to be made out of in order to provide the proper chemical resistance. Remember that when looking at the pressure rating of a hose in our literature, that pressure is rated at room temperature. And as the temperature of the application increases, that hose's rated working pressure decreases, and there are temperature derating charts that we can consult to help determine that. And if you, if you guys aren't comfortable using that, it's the temperature derating charts. We use the same ones that are approved by NAHAD. They're on our website. If you need any help with that, call us. We're happy to help. Also, NAHAD recommends if there are dynamic pressures in the applications, pulsations, shock pressures, water hammer, there are derating factors listed here that should be applied to that hose to derate that hose down to be able to better accommodate those dynamic pressures. We talked about the flexibility required. You wanna make sure that that hose is never installed in a radius smaller than that minimum dynamic bend radius as specified in our literature. And then we can also help with chemical compatibility issues. If you get us the name of the chemical being transferred as well as the temperature and concentration, we can consult various industry resources and relay that information to you to provide your customer. We all know about measuring the proper length of a hose assembly. It's true for all hose types, including corrugated metal hose. So make sure that the hose is laying out flat and straight. I'm on a webinar right now. I'm on a webinar right now, so just be, if you can. Just... Chuck, uh, we can hear you. If you want to mute yourself, I'll keep going here. Thank you. All right, so it's very important to measure that assembly properly. <clears throat> also, when measuring that assembly, oops, pardon me, um, sometimes the customer says, you know, I don't know how long the assembly needs to be, but I need it to handle various movements. So again, there are length calculation formulas to be able to determine how much corrugated metal hose is required to perform various movements. Uh, constant radius traveling loops, where the radius of the hose does not change during movements, various radius variable radius traveling loops where the radius does change as the hose undergoes its movement and then other uh, formulas as well I have trouble getting my slides to, to move here excuse me lateral offsets angular deflections again there are standard formulas approved by nahad that hose master uses if you need help with them let us know we'll be happy to help one note i will mention here some hose manufacturers use other formulas than what are approved by NAHAD in order to make their products appear to be more flexible. So just be warned that sometimes there is fuzzy math being used out in the industry by some companies, and we need to be aware of that, cognizant of that. This slide is probably one of the most important slides we'll look at today. It is the force that is exerted on a metal hose when it's pressurized. So if you have a four inch inside diameter metal hose, that's being used at a pressure of 150 PSI working pressure. Remember that corrugated tube is trying to stretch back out to elongate back into the tube that it was formed from. And the braid and the fitting and welded attachments are what prevent that metal hose from elongating because of that Chinese finger trap effect we just discussed. So according to this chart, that four inch hose when pressurized at 150 PSI is actually exerting over 1800 pounds of force on those welded connections in an attempt to try and elongate back into the tube it was formed from. That 1,800 pounds of force must be restrained by the cap weld and the fitting attachment welds, or else the hose is going to pull apart and it's gonna fail catastrophically. 
That's why it's very, very important to make sure that these assemblies are welded by someone who's been trained and qualified to fabricate metal hoses, like the welders at Air Hydro and at Hosemaster, because these numbers can get very high very quickly because that force is equal to the area multiplied by the pressure that's being put into the assembly. Quickly, we're gonna review the do's and don'ts. And with metal hose, it's pretty much the same as other hose types. You wanna avoid twisting the hose. You wanna avoid bending the hose beyond its design. But very importantly for metal hose, you wanna avoid compressing metal hose. So we're gonna look at these do's and don'ts very quickly. The top, there's uh, two columns here, the left-hand most column with the blue and the gray column. The picture on the top of the gray column, that hose is being compressed, as is the hose underneath it. And you can see how those hoses are compressed. They are trying to bend out of their own way, which can create localized overbending directly behind the fitting. And that's where most metal hoses fail due to overbending, is right behind that gray collar. Instead, install the hose either in a looped configuration or a dog leg assembly, or instead of making a sharp bend in the hose, make a sharp bend using an elbow fitting in that third diagram down. Make sure there's sufficient length in the hose assembly so it's not being stretched between mating connections, and make sure that the hose is long enough to accommodate the offsets or movements required, as pictured in that bottom diagram. Moving over to the second column, it's very, very important that the hose not be twisted either during cycling or during installing the assembly. If the customer were to twist that hose during installation, uh, it will apply all of that torsional stress right at that heat affected zone underneath the braid collar. And whenever a customer claims that they had a hose that leaked upon installation, the first thing we will look at are signs of torque when they installed that assembly. One way they can apply torque to that hose is instead of grabbing the hose by the fitting hexes as recommended on that top left-hand diagram or the top blue diagram in the center, they accidentally grab the hose by the brake collar. Very important for corrugated metal hoses to never grab the hose by the brake collar. That will apply all that torsional stress directly to that hose and it will cause it to crack and it will leak upon startup. So very important never to grab a metal hose by the brake collar when installing it. But that next diagram down shows that you might have to replumb the system to keep that hose from scraping on the ground or against other hoses as it undergoes its movement. Also, that cycling movement, if any of that movement is out of the installed plane of the assembly, as pictured in that center set of diagrams, that can apply twisting to the hose assembly. And in those applications, sometimes a swivel joint may be required to eliminate twisting that assembly. The next diagram down again, that hose is being compressed because the movements are in line with the axis of the hose. Instead, install the hose perpendicular to those movements. Also, some hose assemblies require supports, as shown in the bottom diagram, to make sure that they aren't sagging under their own weight, which can also cause that hose to overbend, and that's what's pictured on our next diagram as well. The other diagram here on this slide is how to uncoil a hose assembly without twisting it in the process, and we do recommend, especially for strip-wound hoses, that they pick the coil up and roll it like a tire to gently uncoil that assembly without twisting it. These slides are pretty much redundant. What we've seen already, these are all instances where hoses can be compressed. In the left-hand set of diagrams, either the hose is being compressed, causing it to bend out of its own way, or what's very common with pump connectors, I've got a picture coming up, the bottom gray diagram is where the hose is being compressed in line with itself, causing the braid to bag away from that hose. That hose now only has the working pressure of its unbraided hose, which is much, much lower, and that hose will squirm and deform and fatigue and fail if that braid is allowed to slack away from the hose. So we know how metal hoses work by allowing those corrugations to move freely, minimize the amount of stress when forming those corrugations so they have more fatigue to give in service. This is now how metal hoses fail either due to corrosive attack internally or externally, because it was exposed to corrosive media that wasn't designed to resist. Excessive vibration can cause that braid to wear down into the hose. There are certain uh, fabrication options we can provide to eliminate that problem. Signs of overbending of the assembly, which typically is evidenced by the braid bulging out directly behind that fitting. That's a clear indicator in the field that the hose is being bent beyond its design. Any signs of twisting the hose assembly, torque, 
abrasion, external wear showing braid to the wear. If you see any jagged braid wires uh, sticking out from the assembly, that external abrasion has caused those braid wires uh, to come apart, and now that hose's working pressure has been compromised. An external guard or protection would help that. Signs of overpressurization, the corrugation start to deform and inflate, uh, and axial compression where the hose will squirm. Some of these failure modes can look very similar to each other, and that's the value that our lab brings. These are just some pictures of typical assemblies out in the field that you want to avoid. The hose on the left is installed with the end settings 90 degrees away from each other, and pretty much any way the customer tries to move that hose, they're going to twist that assembly. So avoid those applications or install some sort of swivel fitting on that hose to prevent it from being twisted. You can see the hoses on the right were actually installed in a twisted position, and they're probably too long for that application. Those hoses need to be replaced. The picture on the left on the next slide is a short pump connector, and this is something we see all the time where customers use inexpensive braided flex connectors. That hose isn't even long enough to handle any movements, much less any vibration from that pump. It'll fatigue and fail very quickly. You can see the braid has relaxed away from the hose because invariably these get compressed over time. And if it's a longer assembly, allowing that braid to, to slack away from the hose, you'll see what's pictured on the right-hand side where the corrugations actually deform and squirm underneath that braid. So avoid compressing that hose assembly at all costs. Avoid any situations where the hose is going to be dragging against the parapet wall or that piece of angle iron on the left-hand photo, or if it can't avoid it, then you need to put some external protection on that hose. The hose on the right-hand side was installed so that it's going to naturally be overbent in that application. Why they would install a hose with that connection facing up in the air instead of 45 degrees down towards the ground is beyond me, but that hose is destined for premature failure. We can add an a bed risk and a strip mount armor guard on the outside of that assembly to help protect it from overbending in that application. But see how the braid has bulged away from the hose? Again, that's an indicator that hose has been overbent. It's important to remember that different failure modes may look similar to each other, and that's where our product analysis lab can offer value. Send the hose back to us. Let us do an in-depth analysis. We know what we're looking for. We know the difference between different failure modes that may appear very similar to each other and give you know, the correct diagnosis of failure so that corrective action can be taken by the customer. So while the mode of failure can be readily determined, whether it was vibration or overbending or whatever, discovering the cause of that vibration or overbending may be a little more difficult. And again, that's where you guys are experts at it. Or if you need help, call Paul. He'll be happy to go out make a joint call with you, look at the application, and ask questions that may help lead to what the root cause of that failure was. Things that you can look at out in the field are broken, missing braid wires on assemblies, the working pressure has been compromised, signs of torque or overbending, excessive bending stresses around equipment or over walls, things like that, axial compression of the assembly where the hose either tries to bend out of its own way or the braid relaxes away from the hose, Excessive bending or stretching of assembly to make a connection causes overbending, sagging or unsupported hose installations, and general OD appearance. Are there signs of corrosion to the braid wires, chemical residue, any dents in the assembly will compromise its cycle life, mechanical impact, and leakage of products in the area around the assemblies. That's all for the slides. I didn't stop for any questions and answers because I wanted to make sure we had sufficient time here at the end. But that's all for the presentation this morning. And now I'll open it up to the field to see if there's any questions. Um, I don't see anything in chat, so I'll go ahead and, and shut up and <laughs> open up the mic to see if there's any questions from the group, anyone. Yeah, anybody, if you have questions, just go ahead and type those in in the chat field. That's the easiest way to handle this uh, rather than open up everybody's microphone. So if there are any questions, feel free to type those in the chat and Frank will uh, will get to those. But right now, it doesn't look like we have any. So we'll hang out here for a few minutes. And uh, if you have questions, go yeah. ahead and type them in. If not, thank you for joining. Thank you, Frank, for presenting for us. A lot of great information. And uh, be on the lookout for future webinars coming from Air Hydropower. My pleasure. Thank you again for allowing us to participate. Yeah, I'll go ahead and just talk for a minute to give anyone a chance if they want to enter a question into this chat mode. but. Um, 
Air Hydro has been a, a, a steadfast ally of hose masters for many years. You guys have some some grizzled hose industry veterans such as Bruce and Greg, and uh, you know with their their seasoned veteran leadership as well as any assistance that Paul Wong can can add to the mix. Um, you guys can go out there and knock them dead. Um, and also, you know, keep an eye out for those expansion joint applications as well. We're happy to help with those and help you guys look at those applications. So um, we appreciate your guys' time this morning. Uh, Paul, is there anything you want to add at this point? Well, I don't see any questions yet, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you for a second. You might have lost Paul. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me now, Frank? Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was using headphones. I was just going to say if, if there are any questions that come up after the presentation, um, either from Air Hydropower or their customers, don't hesitate contacting me um, at uh, any uh, time convenient to you. Uh, also, uh, when uh, we start opening up to make end user calls, look at applications, and those types of things, we can get that scheduled on the calendar and, and take care of that, uh, hopefully, in the uh, coming uh, weeks for sure. But thank you, Frank, uh, for the presentation. It was a fantastic job. And if we don't have any questions, I think we could uh, maybe close this up. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat function right now. It doesn't look like anybody had any questions. But again, as Paul mentioned, if you think of any after the meeting, reach out to us. We're happy to help. <clears throat> Thank you for organizing this. Appreciate everyone's time today. And I'll hand it back over to Air Hydro to let you guys go ahead and, and end up the meeting. All right. Thank you, Frank. Thanks for everybody for attending and have a great day. Thanks, Caleb. Thank you. Bye, everybody.